Well, good morning, City Light, and thank you for plugging in and tuning in from wherever you are at today. Um, as Doug said, uh, my name is Dave Fremstead. And I have the honor to serve as one of our elders here at the church. And, and every now and then, our, our staff asked me to, to uh, preach a morning message. And this time, I said yes to preaching before I knew what the Bible text for the day was. So I think for fun, the staff has assigned me this text that deals with a virgin giving birth. And when I first read that text, I thought, really? Out of all of our theologically astute pastors, you know, that they could have handled this one, but here I am today uh, preaching to you about a virgin giving birth. But I'm thankful for the opportunity, and I'll do my best to unpack it today as, as we look at what seems like a b- bizarre prophecy in a far-off land. You know, I remember when our kids were, were real little, uh, they were at that stage where we were teaching them how to swim. And while they're still very young, we signed them up for one of those baby swimming classes. And I, I believe it was at the, the local Y. And it, these were the kind of classes where the parent would get in, in the water with the baby and just kind of hold the child and kind of float around uh, with, with your child, getting them used to the water. And I remember specifically at, at one of those lessons, my wife Dory was in the pool with our daughter Sarah, and, you know, she's floating around, and the instructor said something like, you know, go ahead and, and gently dip your head's child below the surface of the water to get them used to having water in their face. So Dory gently does that, you know, lowers Sarah's face down. Um, you know, Sarah probably spits and sputters a little bit. Then uh, Dory quickly brings her up and cradles her on her shoulder. Upon which, immediately, Sarah sinks her baby teeth into Dory's shoulder, chomping down hard as if to say, don't ever do that to me again. She did not appreciate that experience. And she actually left teeth marks in Dory's shoulder to make her point. Now, however, things did improve in the, in the swimming department, and as they grew older, they became more comfortable around the pool. And at that season in our lives, uh, we lived quite a distance from my parents. So to encourage getting together, we would often meet at a halfway point and intentionally stay at a pool or at a hotel that had a pool in it. And the pool time at those hotels, that was always a highlight of our weekend visits. You know, we would bust out the pool noodles, the, the toys, and we would outfit those kids with those inflatable things that would go over their biceps, and they would run around, and it was a highlight. And I knew our kids enjoyed it because there were no more teeth marks left in Dory's shoulders. Josh and Sarah were at a fun age in their life there where, where they would stand on the edge of the pool, you know, and they jump into our arms and, and out in the water, and nothing brought me more joy as, as a dad is when they stood on the edge of the pool and they, they looked, looked down at the water and then looked out at me, looked down at the water again, and then with a smile made that leap and jumped into my arms. Now, those first few jumps that they, that they were, would make were, was always accompanied by a lot of hesitation, you know. Uh, and, and you could see the, their minds turning in their little toddler brains, and they had this little mini crisis on their hands because they're thinking, Dad is, is way out there, you know, and he's in the deep water, and it's a long way from the edge, yet he's out there calling to me saying, Jump, I got you. And after some hesitation, they, they jumped. Why? Why did they jump? Well, for one, they realized that we would no longer try to drown them in the pool. But they also knew that, that jumping out into our, into our arms, into their father's arms, was a safe thing to do. They trusted me to, to keep them safe each and every time they jumped. Now, they still had a little inner crisis going on in their lives, but with each jump, their trust deepened. And they became more and more confident that taking a risk and jumping towards their father was not only an okay thing to do, but it was kind of fun as well. You know, there's times in our lives where we stand on the edge of what we know with the solid ground under our feet, and we just like to dwell there, don't we? Because it's safe, it's comfortable, it's in the midst of the known, the routine. 
But then there's other times where God is calling to us to jump into the deep water, out into the unknown. He's out there in in the deep end of the pool that we call the uncertainties of life, and we're thinking to ourselves, I can't even swim. And God is saying, jump. I got you. I am with you. It's at those points of crisis in, in our lives, those times of uncertainties and unknowns, where we begin to feel the ground upon which we stand shake and rumble. We feel it begin to shift and move. And it's at those points of crisis and the chaos that it brings that our true faith is revealed and made known to us. You see, God uses the crises in our lives to expose our true faith, to expose what we truly believe in. Today we want to look at how this is played out in an Old Testament character named King Ahaz. We're continuing our our Christmas series through Isaiah, and today we come to chapter 7, where King Ahaz, the ruler of the southern kingdom called Judah, is faced with a very real crisis and one incredible opportunity. And the crisis that King Ahaz faces exposes where his heart is really at. So as we look at this text today, we're going to see how crisis first uncovers what we truly believe in, and second, how crisis can point us to the one called Emmanuel. Now, to give you a little background of what's going on in Isaiah, we can sum up the historical context with four words. The Assyrians are coming. The Assyrians, they're big and bad, and they're taking names. They are a powerhouse nation focusing on expanding and taking as much territory as possible, and they ultimately have their sights set on the country of Egypt. But in order to do so, in order to get there, they have to conquer a few nations along the path, along the way. And in the way stands Israel, the people of God. So at this point in history, the the people of Israel are divided into two nations. you got the kingdom in the north called Israel, which makes sense, right? And the kingdom in the south is called Judah, often referred to as as the house of David. And these two kingdoms are divided, they're not getting along, and there's civil war raging between them. So in the scene that we know as Isaiah chapter 7, both Israel and Judah are keenly aware that Assyria is headed their way. So in a feeble attempt to resist the Assyrians, Israel to the north formed an alliance with another country in order to hopefully build some military strength. And this northern alliance is then trying to force the kingdom of Judah into joining them. And in fact, they're threatening to take Judah by force so they can build this alliance against Syria. Basically, it's a mess. And to add to the mix, other nations are taking advantage of the political and military instability at the time, and they're crossing over into Judah. And to put it plainly, times are not good for Judah and the house of David for which it represents. Turmoil and threats and chaos on every side. So in the midst of this political and military crisis, the true faith and character of Ahaz is uncovered and revealed. Let me read for you from Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 2. When the house of David, which is Judah, when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, which is another name for the northern kingdom of Israel, The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. Because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. 
I love how the prophet Isaiah refers to these two nations that are threatening Judah. He just calls them out and says, they're, they're smoldering stumps. In other words, they're, they're nothing. But did you also catch the other part of the message to Ahaz? He says, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. Ahaz was so busy scheming and maneuvering that the prophet literally has to tell him to quiet down, slow down, and trust. Then then Isaiah says something pretty interesting in verse 9. He states that if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. A little literal translation would say, if you are not firm, you will not be confirmed. Wow. Unbelief and instability go hand in hand. True in the day of King Ahaz and true in our day as well. So God is giving King Ahaz a choice and a sign. uh, Let's read again beginning in verse 11. He says, the Lord spoke to Ahaz and said, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as the heaven. And then then King Ahaz kind of gives this this misguided attempt to be pious when he says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. So then the Lord says, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God? And then comes verse 14, which is this interesting prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, when faced with a national crisis, King Ahaz would rather take things into his own hands than to trust in God. And this is so relevant, so real for our world right now. This year has been one of just civil unrest, of spiritual unrest, national divisiveness, and contention on multiple fronts. And in the midst of all, we scramble around and and we try to make sense of it all. So we try to build our own stable world, or at least what we think is stable. We, We take matters into our own hands, we do our own things, yet without God we are left with a weaky, and shaky foundation. If we are not firm in our faith, we will not be firm at all. We are so often like King Ahaz, aren't we? See, the crises that we all face in life, they, they have this innate ability to kind of peel back the layers of the onion that make up the shell of our lives. And like onions, we, we all have layers. Now, granted, some of us are more pungent onions than others, but we all have layers. So stress at work, a layer is peeled back. Struggles in a relationship or in a marriage, off goes another layer. Trying to parent your kids and feeling like a failure, another layer stripped off. Severe sickness, off goes another layer. Fear of getting COVID, another layer. Uncertainty about the COVID vaccine, one more layer. Uh, I've got to be honest with you. All this conflict, this tension, the isolation and division of this past year, it's rattled me somewhat, and it's challenged my own faith. COVID has impacted my job and the nonprofit that I work for. The isolation and social distances has impacted my mental health, and I've learned through it all that I'm a pretty relational person, and I long for community when that's taken away from me. And there's been times over this last year where all I have seen are my own fears and struggles. They seem to keep rising to the surface. The, The layers of my life that make up my outer shell are being peeled back. And like King Ahaz, part of me just wants to make a plan and work my way out of any bad situation I find myself in. And through it all, there's that part of me that just wants to stay out of the deep water and keep my feet planted on the firm ground. 
each and every time, crisis after crisis, the question before us all really is what do we really trust in? Where does our faith lie? Does it rest in ourselves and our own plans and schemings? Or does our faith rest in God? In Emmanuel, a name which so powerfully means God with us. God with you. You see, God said to King Ahaz that his sign and his promise to him would be a child. A child that represents his presence. A child called Emmanuel. So he says, behold, and, and uh, just a word that means look, hey, pay attention. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God ultimately fulfilled that promise, prophecy and promise of Emmanuel in Jesus. You see, God not not only uncovers our faith, crisis not only uncovers where our faith lies, but it can also point us to Emmanuel, who is Jesus the Christ. And that's the second point of today. See, King Ahaz found himself with a choice. On, On the one hand, he had his own plan that focused on a lot of political maneuvering and and building strategic alliances. On the other hand, the Lord is saying to him, do not fear. Do not let your heart be faint. Because the Lord, I'm going to give you a sign. And that sign is a child called Emmanuel, which means I am with you, God with us. So he had before him an opportunity and an invitation to trust. Unfortunately, King Ahaz chose political maneuvering, and Isaiah's prediction then came true when he said, if you're not firm in your faith, you're not going to be firm at all, because in a matter of years, the kingdom was gone. But today, we have a kingdom that's not going anywhere. We have hope. And this hope has a name, Jesus. In the first book of the, the New Testament, The Gospel of Matthew tells us that this sign of a virgin giving birth explicitly refers to Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, our Emmanuel, God with us. That's the person of Jesus. Fully God, fully human. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. But as he, Joseph, Considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So so here's Joseph, a carpenter by trade, a blue-collar worker, and he believed the message of of an angel. He believed that his son would be Emmanuel. But here's this king, King Ahaz, who did not believe the message of God given to him through a prophet named Isaiah. The choice placed before King Ahaz is the same choice that's placed before us. We can choose to go our own way, or we can trust in a child born of a virgin. It comes down to the question that we must all answer today. In what are you trusting? The crises that we face in life, they're going to uncover and reveal where our trust lies. In those times of crises, that they, they will come. Maybe you're in one right now. And I pray that these difficult seasons in life will point you to the one that truly matters, 
but they'll point you to Emmanuel, God with us. In the New Testament book of John, another one of the gospel writers, um, John writes and refers to Jesus in chapter 1, verse 14, when he says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. You see, the dwelling of God is now among us. That means right right here, right now, uh, right in our midst, God is with us. And that, that's, that's the message of Christmas. That our God, Emmanuel, is dwelling with us. You see, God put on flesh, walked among us in order to bring us back into a relationship with Him. So He is the one and only God who is continually relevant through all the ages. He is the one who is real in every generation. The one who is responsible in creating you. And we were made for a relationship with Him. And the ultimate crisis, the ultimate crisis we face is not the in political instability of our time. It's not COVID. It's not even the loss of a job. It's sin. It's a virus that has infected all of humanity. And the prognosis is eternal separation from God and death. Yet, there is a cure. Life can be found. That cure has a name. Jesus. So while the world scrambles to get a hold of a COVID vaccine, there already is the ultimate vaccine available to all. It is with us. It is among us. It is named Emmanuel, Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that wipes out every sin and the stain that it leaves. So today I ask you, in what are you trusting? Through Jesus, God places before us an opportunity and invitation to trust Him. So today, will you? Will you trust in Jesus? Will you embrace the one called Emmanuel and and put your loyalty in Him? So like this Old Testament king named Ahaz, we, have, we at times, we try to maneuver and build our own kingdoms. We plan, we network, we maneuver, we build alliances all in the hopes that in the end we'll, we'll come out ahead. And at other times, it feels like we're just we're standing on the edge. We're, we're, we're looking down at the water, but instead of it being a calm hotel pool with the shallow end before us, it's, we're standing before raging, foaming waters that we call life. And there's nothing serene or prosaic about these waters. They are fast moving, and we can't see what's around the bend. We hear the roar of the waters. We see the rapids. And one part of ourselves, man... One part is just shouting, stay on the bank. Stay where you're at because at least it's dry here and we can see the ground under our feet. But Jesus is saying, trust me. I got you. I got you. I got you. I came into this world for you. So trust in the one called Emmanuel. Trust in Jesus. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I'm so grateful that that you took the initiative to come to us. That as your scripture says, you, you put on flesh and you dwelt and walked among us. You are Emmanuel. So Father, I pray that that we today will embrace Jesus as our Emmanuel. And Father, as we do, may may we put aside our own planning, our own scheming, our own attempt to try to make sense of life. And Lord, may we look to you as the author of our life. So Father, you make this possible. So we look to you today. And we surrender our lives into your hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. step down